Howdy folks, and welcome back to the good, the bad, and the ugly, episode 62 in World of Tanks, with the mighty jingles, to my eternal shame. It turns out that the last time I did one of these videos was on the 9th of May 2019. <laughs> it's been nearly two years since I did an episode of the good, the bad, and the ugly. I am so very sorry, but you have all been very good little salt miners, so... Well, it's back. You deserve it. Today's first clip comes to us courtesy of G.R. Johnson here in the Panzer 5 4, which is basically a Panther hull with a Panzer Mark IV turret and gun on top, complete with some skirts around the turret to provide additional protection against shaped charge ammunition. Johnson is not the only person who's noticed something very strange in this battle. Take a look at the team lists. Take a look at both team lists. That's a lot of Excelsiors. When did Excelsiors suddenly become this popular? There are eight in this battle. Four in each team. And why are they all following the T1 Heavy like a bunch of baby ducks chasing after their mother? Well, if you haven't figured out the reason by now, allow me to elucidate. Oh, that's a good word. I must remember to use it more often in conversation. They're bots. Pretty impressive bot program, I have to say. I remember the first bot that I saw. Actually, I think it was in the video with Schrader. Do you remember him? <laughs> that's going back a few years. Old Schrader. Quite possibly the worst World of Tanks player ever. Old Mr. Unfair Plane, he Kemp Bush. <laughs> He's actually on No You Meme, by the way. Um, yeah, turns out we made him quite famous. But in that battle, I can remember that there was a bot on the team. Some German heavy. And you could tell it was a bot because it never moved at all. It just sat there in the same spot right from the start of the game. But every time an enemy tank popped up on the minimap, Regardless of how far away it was, regardless of whether or not there was a mountain between this bot and the enemy contact on the map, the turret immediately turned to point towards wherever the spotted enemy tank was. And that's all it did. A lot less sophisticated than the modern crop of bots that we're seeing, well, here, in the shape of all of these Excelsiors. I suppose I should admit that I don't know for a fact that every single one of these Excelsiors is a bot, but they're certainly behaving like bots. I mean, I don't know, but I suppose it must be actually very difficult to program a bot with AI to perform even moderately well in a game like World of Tanks. But they appear to be getting around it by just, well, picking the tank that moves forward first and then following it, and presumably, when they finally see something to shoot at, shooting at whatever that tank is shooting at. Looks like the team have run into severe problems over on the eastern end of the map, due of course in no small part to the bots programming. All it took was three or four members of the team to go this way and all the bots followed them. <laughs> so <laughs> that's half the team. All clustered down one end of the map where so far at least there are no enemies to be shot at. Johnson, after having some fun with the bots, starts heading back, ready to defend the base. What is it that makes the Excelsior such a popular choice for bots anyway? Well, I can think of a couple of reasons. First, it's tier 5. It's extremely difficult to lose money when you're playing at tier 5, even without a premium account. As well as this, of course, the Excelsior is a premium. It's an extremely cheap premium because it's only tier 5. Which means you can basically go AFK from the start of the battle in an Excelsior and still make a profit. Johnson's not having a particularly good game, of course. But he didn't send this battle in because he did well. Man, look at all of that gold. <laughs> That's, remember kids, only 5% of all ammunition fired in World of Tanks random battles is gold. And that's all of it right there. So I guess from here on in, we're just going to watch the bots as they follow that T1 Heavy around. And I have to say the T1 Heavy is going to do an absolutely outstanding job. Although the presence of all of those bots is going to present him with something of a problem later on in this battle. He's 
not really enjoying the attention that he's receiving from the enemy artillery at the moment. I found myself wondering, because if you look at the names of the Excelsior drivers, um, well, you know, not that there's anybody actually driving the Excelsiors, but if you look at the names, I mean, at least one of them's in a clan. They don't look like bot accounts. They look like people who have... And I'm just guessing here, because I don't actually know how this works. But occasionally when you're watching World of Tanks videos on YouTube, you get an advert at the start for credit earning services. And I'm wondering if that's what we're actually seeing here. Here come all the little bots. They're following the KV-220 now. I don't know how that one got over there. I don't know who he was following. And there's an enemy Excelsior, and I'm pretty sure that's a bot too. Note that Johnson's wrecked tank is taking hits from something. <laughs> What's going on here? Who's shooting at him? Where's that coming from? I'm starting to think that these bot programs might not be quite as sophisticated as I first believed. <laughs> The tank's dead, stop shooting at it. But yeah, I'm, the conclusion that I came to was that whoever owns all these Excelsiors has employed some third-party service to basically take over for a day or two and earn a couple of million credits. All of which, of course, is completely against the terms of service of World of Tanks on a number of different levels. First, you're not supposed to share your account details with anyone, and, well, you're also... Uh, probably shouldn't need to say this, not supposed to run bot programs. And yet, clearly, many, many people are. Well, anyway, I've skipped ahead to when the T1 Heavy, who's done remarkably well, by the way, now finds himself with a bit of a problem, because the only other surviving tanks on the team are all bots. <laughs> They're all following him because they're bots, and that's what they're programmed to do. And the reason this is a problem is because he doesn't have an awful lot of health left. He's basically a one-shot kill. And if he moves, the bots are all going to evacuate the base, and look, here they come. <laughs> Somebody needs to defend the base. The bots aren't going to do it. Which means the T1 Heavy can't leave the base, because the bots are all following him. So he really kind of needs to stay. You can see the problem here, can't you? <laughs> Where the T1 leads, the bots cheerfully follow. He's basically got his own little lemming train. <laughs> and no amount of cursing or instructions in chat are going to do anything. Because they're bots. And he really, with the amount of health that he has left doesn't want to be the one taking the lead. So all we can really do is try to find some concealment and try to get the first shot off and hopefully a kill on any enemy tanks that try to push the base. And at the same time he's got to try to take a position where the bots that are following him are going to end up somewhere where they can actually be useful because they have well, they have the numbers advantage over the enemy team, but the enemy team have at least two actual players. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Come on, Excelsiors. Do something useful. Because they're just kind of clustering around on the corner. Oh, wait, is there some movement? Oh, two of them are moving up. And the two to the rear are following them. I'm not quite sure what's prompted the two Excelsiors in front to move. Perhaps they're trying to get closer to the T1 Heavy, realising that there was no path straight to him, they're heading around. And this is good, because it now means that... Oh, and the tree just fell over there. So there is an enemy tank moving through that gap. And they should see the Excelsiors first, and hopefully start shooting and give their positions away. Come on. Don't be shy. Let's hope it's not the enemy Excelsior. <laughs> <laughs> Although it wouldn't be, would it? Because if it's a bot, it's going to be following... Oh, it is the enemy Excelsior, who might not actually be a bot. Enemy Churchill was actually following the Excelsior. Oh, T1's taken hits from man has been knocked out by the Matilda Black Prince. So now we've got an unusual situation. 
four bots against a Mark III Churchill and a Matilda Black Prince. I'm not sure where the Matilda Black Prince was, but he's not shooting at any of those Excelsiors. So possibly, possibly in the monastery in the middle of the map. He definitely doesn't have a firing angle. And the Excelsiors are backing off and returning fire at the Churchill who's just sitting there. I'm wondering if the Churchill's a bot as well, because he was following the enemy Excelsior. Come on, bots, you can do it. Stop running away. What are you doing? It's just one Churchill. Finish him. And... Wow, they're taking their time. Oh, the Churchill's starting to back off. Can they? They've got him. One of the bots has now done better than 14 of the other tanks in this battle. And that just leaves the enemy Matilda Black Prince. And we have no idea where he is. Oh, wait, there he is. 42 seconds of this game remaining. What are the bots up to? They are actually moving in the direction of the last spotted enemy tank. Oh wait, no they're not. They're heading into the monastery. Look at the minimap. <laughs> they're now heading away from the reported location of the last spotted enemy tank. Bloody hell, bots, you had one job. <laughs> Are they trying to cap? Honestly, I have no idea how sophisticated this bot program is. It's the best bot program I've seen so far, but I can't help but feel that it definitely still needs some work. Oh well, never mind. I guess it's a draw. One thing I will point out, however, and feel free to draw your own conclusions, I don't know whether or not it says more about the quality of the bot program that those Excelsiors were using, or the lack of quality of the rest of the actual players in this battle, but one of those Excelsiors managed to finish second only to the T1 Heavy. Which means he got a better result, or it got a better result, than 28 of the other tanks in this battle. That's right kids, we now live in a time when a shitty bot program is a better teammate than the overwhelming majority of the actual players taking part in a game of World of Tanks. What a time to be alive. So, what do you think is the rarest medal that you can get in World of Tanks? It's definitely not Top Gun. Top Gun's 10 a penny. It's not Randy Walter's medal. It's not the Pools medal, which, while definitely not easy to come by, I've featured enough replays quite regularly of people earning those types of medals that they're definitely not the rarest medal that you can earn. How about the Kolobanov's medal? For those of you who don't play World of Tanks, in order to earn a Kolobanov's medal you have to be the last tank left alive in your team against at least five enemies and win. Definitely not a common medal, but all it really requires to get one is, well, you have to be pretty good. The enemy team has to be pretty shit, just not quite as shit as your team. And under those circumstances, Kolobanov's medals are actually kind of likely. Warpig here in the IS-3A is not going to be earning a Kolobanov's medal. He's going to be earning something even more rare than that. And the clue is in his ammunition count. Warpig's IS-3A features a three-shot autoloader, yet only one shot is loaded. Why is that, Warpig? That's because Warpig is a silly sausage who didn't bother to reload his ammunition supplies before joining this battle. He only has seven shots, one APCR, three high explosive anti-tank gold, and three high explosive. And because you cannot mix and match ammunition types, and because he only had one round of APCR, and APCR was the default ammunition for this tank, that meant that at the start of the battle, it couldn't load three APCR, it could only load one. Oh dear. Now he's chewing through his high explosive anti-tank gold ammo. He's fortunate in that he is in an IS-3A, which is a Russian auto reloader. Different from all of the other auto reloaders, most of which are the Italians. In an Italian auto reloader, the reload gets slower, the less shots are in the magazine. But because this is a Russian auto reloader, the reload is faster the fewer shots that are in the magazine. Which is very, very useful for Warpig, because he's basically started off with bugger all. 
So, given his extremely difficult ammunition situation, can you guess which extremely rare metal Warpig is going to earn in this battle? It's probably not too much of a spoiler if I say it's going to be a Faden's medal, a medal that I have only ever managed to earn once. To get a Faden's medal, you have to knock out the last tank left alive on the enemy team with the last round of ammunition available in your tank. When I earned it, this was years ago. And I managed to earn it in, I think it was the Russian Su-5 artillery. Look, I'm not proud of it, okay. <laughs> <laughs> this was of course back in the day when artillery used to do a lot of damage when it scored a hit. The thing about the Su-5 was it wasn't actually that unusual if you were going to earn a Faden's medal to get it in the Su-5 because depending on the gun that you had equipped it only went into battle in the first place with something like 12 rounds of ammo. That's how I got my one and only Faden's medal. The thing about the Faden's medal though Rare though it is, it's one of those medals that, if you're under the right circumstances, you can game the system for. I have seen people who, realising that a Faden's medal were up for grabs, found themselves, for example, with just a couple of shots left, and the last tank left alive on the enemy team was AFK, or had flipped and was unable to fight back. If you do find yourself under those circumstances, it's a little risky, but it can be worth knocking the enemy tank down to a position where it's a one-shot kill and then firing off all but one of your shots into the ground and then finishing it off with the last shot in the tank. But you'd better hope it doesn't bounce. <laughs> but I have seen it done. But it is something that's worth remembering if you ever do find yourself in that position. He's down to the high explosive now, by the way. <laughs> Four shots fired, three shots left. What is the Object 416 shooting at? Well, he's obviously got something worth shooting at. I just can't help but think that he's missing a golden opportunity here to get around behind the lever. Ah, whatever. Here he comes. High explosive, 43 damage. That, of course, is the problem with high explosive. You have to actually strike the body of the tank. Instead, he hit the front drive wheel, immobilised him, and caused very minor splash damage. Fortunately, the Object 416 has come to the rescue. And I'll say this about Warpig. I don't know if you've noticed in chat, but every time somebody does come to his assistance, he does take the time to stop and thank them for it. Uh, which is kind of rare, and is good to see. I'm not sure what's going on with his camo though, it looks like a Day of the Dead camo. Well, I've used the word camo <laughs> in the broadest possible sense of the word. I don't see how that monstrosity can possibly reduce your visibility, but hey, whatever. Two shots left. Three enemies. It's difficult to see how the team can actually lose at this point. They do outnumber the enemy team by three to one. Oh, there's the Lorraine 155. Somebody else has softened him up. Locked on. Got him. One shot left. Two enemies. S1, T34-3. Somebody needs to kill one of them. And then hopefully reduce the other one to such low health that a single high explosive shell is going to be able to kill him. Come on team, you can do it. Oh, there we go. Right. One enemy tank remaining. It's the T-34-3. Can he take him out with one high explosive shell? Oh, he can now. And that, kids... ...is how you earn yourself a fate. I don't recommend this uh, technique. <laughs> Generally, I feel it is better to actually go into battle with a full ammunition load. But rare though it is, the Faden's Medal is not the rarest epic medal available in World of Tanks. There is one other that I have never seen. At least, not until today. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, this is Off the Fritz in the Hellcat, the Tier 6 extremely fast and stealthy American tank destroyer with an extremely punchy 
90mm gun. The Hellcat has seen a couple of nerfs since it was first introduced many, many years ago, and honestly, it did kind of need them. When this tank first found itself in World of Tanks, it wasn't unusual to see people using it as a light tank with a very, very big gun. It was not at all uncommon to see Hellcat drivers using this machine's exceptionally good speed, manoeuvrability and turret traverse to run rings around enemy tanks, circle strafing them in exactly the same way that light tanks used to. Basically, the Hellcat used to be, to all intents and purposes, a Type 64 with a 90mm gun, and you can imagine how scary that would be. And so, quite rightly, the manoeuvrability and the turret traverse were fairly heavily nerfed. Overnight, the Hellcat went from being one of the best light tanks at Tier 6 uh, to a thoroughly dependable and reliable tank destroyer at Tier 6, although it took about as long as you'd expect for the average Hellcat driver to realise this, and many, many Hellcat drivers died pointlessly trying to perform the light tank role before they eventually figured it out. Because reading patch notes is hard. Oh, that Fury's about to have himself a fun and engaging gameplay experience. <laughs> there it is. Oh, don't worry, he's not dead. Yet. Oh, he's just gotten himself spotted again. <sighs> oh, never mind. Top tip. When you're a one-shot kill and you manage to go undetected, take the hint and stop shooting. Actually, stop shooting is going to be the theme of this battle, although not just yet. I'm going to skip forward a few minutes to when Off the Fritz decides to make his move, which happens after the enemy Rheinmetall Borsig, who is hiding behind the windmill down there, has been knocked out. The team are not doing too well, they're losing three kills to six. And this flank has not been completely cleared. There is an SU-100 over there and the team have just lost an MT-25. Off the Fritz is going to have to be real careful here. He could easily get caught in a crossfire if he gets spotted. Putting that rock between himself and the SU-100. Looking for targets. And the team are starting to pull kills back. One SU-100 and the Centurion have just been knocked out. This is a Tier 8 battle, by the way, just in case it wasn't obvious, and he is just in a Tier 6 tank destroyer. Although, to be fair, a very good Tier 6 tank destroyer. Spotted the enemy artillery, although he doesn't have a shot. And there's the SU-100 he was concerned about on this flank. Takes the shot. Flat side armour, naturally, absorbed by the tracks. Fortunately, the ARL, also on this flank with him, managed to finish him off. And he is taking some awful risks here, because he is in completely open ground and not in any kind of concealment. So he moves back up to the line of the bushes, and there's the Lorraine 155 again. Still tucked in behind the farmhouse. Now the team have managed to equalise the scores at seven kills each, but, well, this is a closely contested battle. It can absolutely go either way. And the enemy team pull another kill back knocking out a tiger. There is a chance to equalise here. He's finally got a line of fire on the Lorraine, but it's going to take more than one shot, even with a 90mm gun. And, yep, he's gone. Although, once again, the enemy team have managed to pull the scores back, and there's the other enemy artillery. And again, this is probably going to take two shots. There's one. Very nice of the AMX to pull back into the line of bushes. So off the fritz wouldn't be spotted. Scores are 9-9. Could still go either way. 10-10. 11-10. So at this point that off the fritz decides it's probably going to be safer with the scores at 11 each if he heads to the cap circle. And this, kids, is why you always drive over and demolish the buildings in the middle of the cap circle at the start of the battle before you leave the base because the only thing that they do is provide partial cover for anybody capping the base. They won't stop an armor-piercing shell, but they will stop a high-explosive shell. And people often load high-explosive to guarantee some damage and a reset against anybody capping. Do you remember how I said the theme of this battle was going to be don't shoot? <laughs> I have no doubt that at this precise moment off the fritz is having to hold his finger off the fire button with his other hand. <laughs> because if he does, he's going to get spotted. Although, actually, no. 
No, the Striv 74 managed to drive behind a line of bushes, so he was able to shoot without being spotted. And oh no, it should be dead, but the first shot just immobilised him. He used his repair kit, the second shot didn't quite kill him. Come on, no, bounced off the turret armour. Come on, somebody please take that guy out. Anybody? Oh, ARL V39 to the rescue again. That just leaves an enemy Tiger 2 and a VK who were last spotted all the way over to the other end of the map. 20 seconds to go. 80% base capture. And at least one enemy tank is trying to counter cap. But they've left it way too late. I guess they're just trying to farm some loser points. <laughs> Before the end of the battle. But this battle is definitely over. There it is, base capped. And the most rare medal in the game for Off the Fritz, because he played this entire battle without being spotted once and managed to successfully cap all the way from 0 to 100. And that, kids, is the Raider Medal. A medal that is so rare in World of Tanks, I honestly thought Wargaming were just making it up and it was nothing more than a myth. That is the first and only time I have ever seen it. We're going to finish off today's Bumper World of Tanks video with Memblem 1999 in the German Tier 9 heavy tank, the E75. The E75 has been around a very long time in World of Tanks now, but despite the fairly inevitable power creep in a game that's been around as long as World of Tanks, the E75 has still got it where it counts. A very tough tank providing you can keep the lower glacis covered up and remember to angle what is a very boxy armour profile. And while the gun lacks damage per minute, it does have a very satisfying alpha strike. Memblem is not the only star of this battle, however. He's going to have to share the headlines, for all the wrong reasons, with one of his teammates. And that teammate is Nikin78 in the Skoda T50. And if you pay close attention to chat, don't worry, I'll let you know when. You'll see why. I've skipped ahead a couple of minutes to when Memblin makes his move on the cap circle. Obviously not stopping in the open to sit and aim at the enemy standard B and score a very lucky hit on the move with the E75's 128mm gun. I've taken the liberty of enlarging the chat window for you, just so you don't miss anything in case you happen to be watching this video on a mobile device with a screen that doesn't support the resolution high enough to be able to comfortably make out what's being said in chat. IS-6B around the corner there. Honestly, you know, there are so many Tier 8 premium Russian tanks in World of Tanks these days that I, I really just I can't even keep track anymore. The only thing I really know about the IS-6B is that it does have terrible penetration for a Tier 8 Heavy, so it's not really surprising that it's going to be firing gold. IS-6B doing his best to side scrape and protect his tank there, Memblum. Might have put a shot right through the driver's hatch, might have knocked out the driver, don't know. Falls back, waiting for the reload. Obviously wants to finish off the IS-6B in order to clear one flank so he can start angling his armour against the enemy tanks on his left. Like that Object 704 for example. An Object 704 for whom 286 millimeters of penetration clearly isn't enough. Well clearly it isn't enough, it bounced. Yeah, it bounced because he's shit. <laughs> the standard B is managing to do just fine with less. The 704 however is clearly a firm proponent of the theory that pressing the 2 key and loading the gold is the practical alternative to actual skill. It's here, however, where things do start to kick off in chat, with the Skoda T50 driver complaining, why is it that these fucking Czech animals don't have their own server? His words, not mine. Seems a bit racist, but hey, that's just me. He's not gonna stop there, however. Oh no. He's just getting warmed up. Memblem in a very, very tough spot here. Oh, and here comes the other 5% of gold ammunition that gets fired in World of Tanks battles in the shape of the AMX AC-48. Although, to be completely fair, judging by his extremely good rate of fire, he is only using the 90mm gun, so his use of gold ammunition under these circumstances is entirely understandable. Still gonna get a kill, though. 
Now, do you remember the IS-6B on the other side? I don't know why he took his time pushing the advantage here when Memblin was occupied with the AMX-48, but he's about to make his entrance. And the standard B keeps trying, it's fair credit to him, and still keeps penetrating, although Memblin was able to finish him off. Oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. Look at this absolute douche canoe in the IS-2S. Serving his teammate up on a golden platter. What an absolute knob jockey. Memblum attempted to chase after him, but conscious of the fact that there are still enemy tanks over there, and he has to keep his armour angled against them. So doing his best to angle against targets like the CS-52 down there, while also trying to angle as best as he can against the IS-2S douche canoe, who could reappear around the corner to his right at any second. Meanwhile, in chat, pay attention and keep an eye out for the team's very own douche canoe, the Skoda T-50, who is about to get extremely angry with the team's WZ-120 for no good reason that I can tell from here, and rather than, oh I don't know, when the scores are as close as this, fighting enemy tanks is going to spend the best part of a minute directing a hail of invective at him in chat. Memblum, meanwhile, still in a very tough spot. Torts on one side, potentially an IS-2S on the other side. Engine, not functioning too well. Very, very little health left. Meanwhile, our friend in the Skoda T-50 has just been knocked out, so he now has absolutely nothing better to do other than to exercise his keyboard skills and encourage his teammates on to greater success by telling them that they're all idiots, check whores, bots, sluts, you know, the usual kind of thing that really encourages you to stir yourself on to greater efforts when you've got your back up against the wall with less than 200 health left fighting a tortoise at point-blank range. Our little friend, who goes by the name of Nickin78, does pause his invective, but only for long enough to tab out and actually check somebody's stats. And I know he does this, because shortly he's going to come back in chat, marvelling that anybody can play as badly as this with eight years experience of World of Tanks. And there's only one way you find that out, that's by tabbing out of the game and pulling up their player profile. All of which is particularly ironic for a number of reasons, because can I just point out that at this stage of the battle, Memblum has done 5,000 damage and bounced 5,000 damage. 10,000 damage combined in the E75 and he's done most of it while on less than 200 health. And the other reason why I find this particularly ironic is because that Skoda T50 player tabbed out of the game in order to check somebody's stats. Why is that so ironic, Jingles? Wait until the end of the battle and I'll show you. In the meantime, let's try to keep up. What's he saying now? You cannot be so fucking stupid. Die of cancer or COVID. Wow, I bet this guy's amazing fun at parties. Memblum, trying to work his way out of this corner where he's trapped himself. Really, really doesn't need to be spotted at this. Oh, shit. Trying to get into cover. Who is it? Who is it? Turn the tank armor around. Oh, he's managed it. And whoever fired just missed. But he knows that shot must have come from down there. And whoever it was just fired. So, again, trying to keep the armor angled. up against the rubble here, maybe use the wreck of the AMX-48. Real nice if he could tell who it was who had him spotted. And he's just moving the tank around, so if anybody is aiming at him, it's going to make it more difficult for them. But knowing exactly who was down there would be very, very welcome at this point. Meanwhile, Field Marshal Erwin Rommel in the Skoda T-50 doesn't seem to think too much of Memblum's tactics as he jolly helpfully tells Memblum that capping is the worst option, you mongol. To be completely fair, I don't actually think Memblum is trying to win by capping, he's trying to use the cover here in the cap circle to keep one flank protected, whilst keeping the rest of his armour angled as best as he can against the most likely avenue of attack. It's just a happy coincidence that he's in the cap circle, but hey, Memblum is open to suggestions. And he asks in chat, what is it that I need to do to win? Well, let it not be said that the T-50 player is not full of useful advice. Now you are raped, idiot E-75. Thanks for the advice, 
that was very useful. <laughs> Um, yeah. The chances of Memblin actually being able to pull a win off here were fairly slim. I mean, he's done extremely well, but yeah. He manages to take one of them out, but the IS-2S just keeps loading the high explosive and taking them down a bit at a time. Which, under the circumstances, is probably exactly the right thing for the IS-2S to be doing. Any further advice from our friend in the T-50? Absolutely, words to the effect of, I told you so, brain dead shit, bye. The Lorraine at least has the good grace to offer a GG. Which, under the circumstances, I do think was thoroughly well deserved. Now, remember, earlier I said that I found it particularly ironic that the Skoda T-50 found the time to tab out of the game after he died and start stat-shaming people by looking up their stats? That's right, Akazuki. Yes. What's that, Akazuki? Two can play at that game? I should look up his stats and stat-shame him right back? Well, I don't know if I should. I mean, that could easily backfire on me. What if he's a really good player? I mean, that doesn't mean he's not an arsehole, obviously, but he... He might actually have better than average stats, despite the fact that he didn't even finish in the top third of the team. What do you think? Is it worth the risk? He could just be a very good player who had a bad game. What's ironic about this is this guy has no compunctions whatsoever about checking up other people's stats in order to stat shame them in chat during battle. But he doesn't want anybody looking at his stats because that's not actually his name. Nickin78 is a name that's been generated using the World of Tanks Anonymizer. A feature that was introduced into World of Tanks specifically to hide your identity and prevent mods like XVM from being able to pull your stats out and display just how good or bad you are. My, isn't that convenient. <laughs> it doesn't end there, though. And here's the... F well, I don't know if it's funny. Yeah, it's kind of funny. Because I did try to look up his stats. And you know what's funny about the name Nickin78? It's a Google Whack. Now, if you don't know what a Google Whack is, I recommend you head over to YouTube and search for Dave Gorman's Google Whack Adventure, because it's fantastic and it's hilarious. But if you don't have time to do that, this is what a Google Whack is. It's a search term consisting of two words with no surrounding quotation marks that produces one single result when entered into the search engine, Google. And if you enter what player Nickin78 into Google, all you get back is an advert for somebody selling a 2004 Toyota Acura TSX for sale in Greenville, South Carolina. Why? Don't know, but it's a Google Whack. Hang on, Jingles. Isn't a Google Whack supposed to be a two-word search term? Well, yeah, all right. So I tried again, this time with just what Nickin78. And this time I got three results, which isn't a Google whack. But two of those results are two malicious and or highly suspect and dodgy websites, so I'm not obviously going to count them, which leaves us with just the one result. How do two introverts start dating? <laughs> so I'm claiming that as a Google whack. And on that bombshell, that's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it, and as always, take care, stay safe, and I'll catch you next time.